Christmas, everybody. How we doing? Hope everybody's good. I want to welcome everybody who's here with us inside, outside, family room, lobby, those of you on Facebook Live, those of you watching online, our friends over at Discovery Church in Simi Valley. We are so glad that you're with us as we wrap up our last of about 500 Christmas Eve services. And uh, we're really thrilled that you are here. It is total stream of consciousness for me from here on out. So who knows what you're going to get. So Buckle up, could be here a couple hours. Um, hey, seriously, uh, we really wanna invite you back to this next series we're kicking off in January. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna be talking about what happy couples know, and we're gonna be walking through just some basic scriptural principles that help out all of our relationships. You're gonna laugh a lot, you're gonna learn a lot, and we're going to be really, really be able to help out marriages. And this is for anybody who's married or hopes to be married. And if you're not married yet, you get to write all this stuff down and it helps you find the person you wanna marry. So make sure that you're here for this, and it's gonna be a great opportunity for us just to learn from each other and to get our marriages healthier and prepare for great marriage. So come back for that. And if you are here right now thinking, hey, I'd love that, but I don't live here and they're kicking me out of the house in a couple days and I got to drive back to wherever I'm from, I get it. But you can join us online, reallifechurch.org and watch our online stream every single weekend and be part of our services just like you were in the building. Love to have you join us. Okay, so uh, we're we're cruising on here, and we're going to talk about some, some really powerful stuff for every single one of us to get our, our mind wrapped around. But before we get into that, I need to ask you a question. By show of applause, how many of you have all of your Christmas shopping done? Okay. Every guy in the room just looked at their wife and said, are we done? Okay, that's great. Guys, don't you love getting to see what you got your kids for Christmas for the first time on Christmas morning? Yeah, what'd I get you? Oh, I love that, absolutely. So uh, for everybody who already has their shopping done, good for you. For the rest of you, you perfectly have uh, my permission to go ahead and shop online while I'm talking, I understand. Um, but seriously, a lot of us did our, sh our, our shopping on Black Friday. In fact, the studies tell us that over 50% of all Americans went shopping on Black Friday. Now that is why it was so crazy out there. And I'm pretty sure all of those people were at the Valencia Target, okay? And, and have been there ever since, right? And it's just crazy out there. Maybe you went out there and they surveyed people and they, they found out people were looking for technology, they were looking for computers, they were looking for some kind of television, some kind of flat screen, some kind of HD, some kind of 4K, whatever it is, some kind of television they were looking for. And so what they did was they asked people in this poll uh, by uh, Slick Deals, they asked them this question, what links would you go to to just get half off of a, of a TV? And they gave all these different scenarios. Here's what's interesting. One out of five people said they would willingly only eat oatmeal for two weeks if it meant getting half price on a TV. That's a lot of oats, okay. Now, one out of 10 people, which is quite a bit of people, 10% said they would endure a, a year-long head cold for half off of a TV. Now, I love my TV, but a year-long head cold, I mean, come on, that's, that's not for me. And this is the thing about Christmas. It brings with it all of these things that we have opinions on. There's all kinds of different foods and traditions and music that we all kind of have opinions on. And some of us say, that's for me. Some of us say, that's not for me. So just so we get to know each other a little bit here, I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen. And if you say, that's not for me, I want you to applaud. Okay, those of you watching online, I really want to hear you from wherever you are, but go ahead and applaud if this is not for you and applaud to the level that it is not for you. Okay, so here we go. Here's the first one. Take a look at this. Fruitcake. All right. Not for you. 
Uh, we've done many of these services. Nobody seems to care for fruitcake. Uh, and, and I am totally there with you. In fact, my parents, they didn't ever make fruitcake, but they had this recipe for fruitcake cookies. And they just thought this was the greatest thing ever. And they claimed it was real expensive, so they'd say we'd have to save up all this money so we could, and my sister and I like, forget the saving, okay? Put the money into the gifts. Don't we, I don't want the fruitcake cookie. It's ridiculous that it's awful. But some people like it, some people don't. You say it's not for you. Okay, here's the next one. It is the fake Christmas tree. How many say not for you? Okay. All right, now I love you, but this is where you're wrong, okay? Because the fake Christmas tree is a wonderful thing. You buy it once, you keep it for life, and those of you dragging in the real Christmas tree, you are putting a bucket of gasoline into your, into your home and plugging it in the wall. I mean, come on. Anyway, that's just my own personal issue. So now this next one, last one we'll do about Christmas, um, it's, it's more of a song because Christmas has so many songs that come up and some we love, some we hate. And I gotta be honest with you, I'll go ahead and tip my hand on this one. I am not a fan of this song. Tell me if you agree with me. Here we go. I'm still amazed there's a music video to go along with that song. I, I can't stand that song. And I, I'm sensing that there's a lot of you that you feel the same way. That song, not for me. Now, the reality is this is not just Christmas. There are all kinds of things we say, that's just not for me. For instance, for those of us who are basketball fans, for many years we said, LeBron James with the Cavs, not for me, okay? Don't care for LeBron at all. But now that he's a Laker, then that's perfectly fine, okay? <laughs> We're all good with that, right? <laughs> Somebody's getting fired over the break. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not appropriate. All right. Uh, <laughs> now, you may not care about basketball or anything, but I know there's stuff that you think, yeah, that's not for me. Some of you right now are just saying, you know what, college, that's not for me. Some of you say, kale, that's not for me. Uh, some of you say, um, you know what, counseling, that's not really for me. For some, you might even say forgiving, that's not really for me. Getting rid of that grudge over that person that's coming to Christmas dinner, not for me. And for a lot of us, if we were really honest, we might even go so far as to say, God is not for me. Now, you wouldn't really come out and say it just like that, but you'd say something like, you know what, I'm just not very religious, or I'm not really into all that stuff. That's good for you, and that was good for my mom, and that might be good for you and the kids, but that's not for me. And maybe you're just indifferent about it. I mean, your life is good. You don't really see a need to pray or ask God for help. You got this. You're fine, and you're just rolling on. For some of you, you just feel a little skeptical. You just think, oh, I'm not sure if I understand it all or if it makes any sense or it seems like a bunch of myths or fairy tales. And so you're just going to go with your gut and hope for the best and the religious stuff isn't for you. For some of you, you would say you're just kind of nervous about it because you know people who claim to be all into the God stuff and you think, I don't want to be like them at all. They seem weird or crazy or they seem like they're really boring and it seems like their God is the God of no, 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 no. And you don't want any part of that either. And so for those of you that have said, you know what, this God stuff is not just for me. It's good for you, not for me. Can I just tell you something? If, if that's you and you're here or you're watching online right now, I am so honored that you chose to be with us. That is a huge gift of your time for something you're not even sure if you believe in. And I just want to tell you, this is a safe place for you to be. We always say around here, no perfect people allowed. You know, we don't have it all figured out. And it is okay. It is okay for you to belong around here before you ever believe what we believe. And I'm glad you're here. But if we were to just kind of peel this back a little bit, maybe dig a little bit deeper into the root cause of us thinking this, maybe it has something to do with what we feel inside, and that is that maybe we just kind of think God is not interested in us. In other words, God is not for me. Maybe you prayed a prayer one time and you didn't sense God came through. Maybe you asked for God's blessing and it seemed to go to the wrong address and you were like, God, I, I meant me. Maybe you kind of look at your life and you think about all the mistakes you've made or the distance that you have with God and you, you know all the wreckage of relationship around you and you look around and you think, they're not for me. I'm not even sure if I'm for me. Is there any way God could be for me? 
And a lot of us have those kind of moments in our life where we wonder, does God even care about us? And to just be totally transparent with you, there was a good season in my life where I felt like God loved me. I just didn't think he liked me. I felt like he's morally obligated to love me because after all, the bumper sticker said, smile, God loves you. So I thought, well, you're on the hook for that one. But like me, impressed with me, happy with me, Uh uh-uh. And maybe you're there. Maybe you're wrestling with that right now. And so what I want to do over the course of our time together here is I just want to talk to two groups of people. And, and group number one, those are, are you that you've, you just feel like you've kind of grown up in a religious experience and maybe you've walked away or maybe you're kind of beginning to walk away because you're thinking, I don't think this stuff is for me. I just don't think that God is for me. I mean, if you knew what I've done and all that, and I don't think he's really interested in me and you're beginning to lose trust if you can be for God. And I want to just encourage you that maybe he's worth taking another look at. And for those of you that kind of feel like this religious stuff is all for somebody else, and you're just here because you're staying at somebody's house, and they said, "Uh, we go to church around here, and here you are. You didn't plan on it, but you got to be there so you can open gifts tomorrow, so here you are. And and if that's you, and you're just here to make somebody happy, I, I get it. But I want you just to consider this. If it were true that God was absolutely for you, wouldn't you have to admit that's the best news for you. So we're going to read some from the Christmas story today, and I'm going to read a passage that kind of sets us up for the Christmas story that we hardly ever read around Christmas. In fact, it is written in the very first part of Matthew's telling of the life of Jesus. And there's four biographies about Jesus that are part of the New Testament that are kind of attached together with the Old Testament, which make up this huge book we call the Bible. But in this telling from an eyewitness about the life of Jesus, when he sits down to write the story of Jesus, as he lived it out with Jesus, he starts way before Jesus is even born. And truthfully, the way he starts, if I'm being honest with you, it's a little boring. In fact, for those of you that have read some of the Bible before, this is probably the part that you see and you just skip over because it's so-and-so, begat, so-and-so, begat, so-and-so, and and it's like, what does that even mean? I don't even say the word begat anymore, so what do I do with that? And we're going to read a little bit of that today because it has a huge implication for all of us. Take a look at what Matthew writes at the beginning of his gospel. He says, this is the genealogy of Jesus. Now, genealogy basically means this is the origin story. This is the family tree of Jesus. And Jesus, the Messiah, that's who we're talking about here. Messiah is the Hebrew word for the Greek word, which is Christ, the Son of God. And that's going to come through the lineage of David. And even if you've never been to church before, you might have heard of David before because of King David, also known as David and Goliath. And then you've got about 1,100 years before that, the son of Abraham. Okay, so you've got Abraham being involved in this, and you think, oh, I may have heard that name before or whatever. So you're tracking pretty good right here. But take a look at the very next thing that Matthew does to us. He drops this little bomb on us of all these names. This is the family tree of Jesus. Now, with all due respect, if I was with Matthew the day he sat down to write this stuff out, I probably would have pulled up a chair and said, Matt, hey buddy, listen, you're about to write a a letter that will be part of the best-selling book of all time for all time, and I want to make sure your letter gets read a lot. Maybe we start off with something a little bit more exciting. Maybe put that in the end notes, you know, and maybe, you know, at a website later on or whatever, but I mean, come on, all the names, people are going to skip over this. Why all the names, Matthew? To which Matthew would say, there's a reason for it. What would his reason be? I mean, not only is there this long list of names, there are some people on here that have tremendous scandal associated with their names, questionable characters. In fact, back then, historians would be paid to keep those kind of people out of a king's genealogy. A king would bring him in and say, listen, here's my story. Here's the people I want you to mention. Here's the people I want you to never mention. And you do the same thing. You've got people you don't want in your family pictures. You're about to have people come to your house for Christmas dinner, and you're going to decide to take the photo after they leave. You know, I know what's going on, okay? It happens at our house, too. And so you have people in your family. You've got your own cousin, Eddie, okay? We've all got one of them, and and maybe they're sitting right next to you. So whatever. Um, You don't want them in your story. And they would pay historians to keep this stuff out. But Matthew, for some reason, 
He seems to highlight these kind of people. And then four of them, four of them actually get a little bit more scandalous because they're women. Now, why is that important? Because back then, you would never include the female in a genealogy line because women back then were considered property. Why would Matthew do that? Well, partly, ladies, I think he wants you to know you are just as valuable as men are. In the eyes of God, he sees you with the same love and respect as he does men. But Matthew's even got another reason for doing this, because he could have picked out any women to highlight in the origin of Jesus, and yet he picks these four. And these four carry with them a lot of baggage. For instance, Ruth. Ruth was not even Jewish. She was a Moabite woman, an outsider from a foreign land, married into the lineage of Jesus. In fact, you would leave her out because she was a Moabite, and Moabites and Jews hated each other. Think Hatfields and McCoys. Think Taylor Swift and Kanye. Okay, that kind of <laughs> level, all right, of angst. I mean, this is a bad story. You would not put her in, but Matthew does. Why does he do that? The next one, even more scandalous, Bathsheba. Bathsheba was a woman married to a guy named Uriah. In fact, the text will even tell us, the, the wife of Uriah. And Uriah and Bathsheba had a little place there in Jerusalem, and Uriah worked for King David, and he was part of his army. And one day Uriah is away on the battlefield fighting for his king, and his king stayed home. And his king wanders out on his palace that day, and he looks down into the apartment of Bathsheba and Uriah, and he sees Bathsheba bathing. And we know she's bathing, because had she been showering, her name would be Shower Sheba. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I'll be here all week. Thank you. Oh, told it eight times, love it every time. Um, but in this moment, David looks down on her and he summons her to come up to his palace. A few months later, they find out she's pregnant, so he tries to cover it all up by having Uriah killed. I mean, you talk about the scandal involved here with this couple. And yet, Matthew just wants to point it out. Why would he do that? He continues on. Here's a couple more names. There's a name Rahab. Rahab was also not a Jew, but she was also a prostitute. Here again, most people would want to leave that out. Matthew puts it right in. And finally, the last name, Tamar. Tamar's story reads a little bit like an episode of Jerry Springer or Real Housewives, okay? It's a little crazy because one of the things she does is she dresses up like a lady of the night to seduce her father-in-law, okay? How's that for the Christmas story? Merry Christmas, everybody, you know? <laughs> This is not what you're going to gather the kids around the fire later. Let's read the story of the, com the coming of Jesus. Oh, Mary and Joseph. No, no, no. Tamar and her father-in-law. Here we go. It's like an HBO miniseries or something. I mean, this, this is scandalous here. Why would you have this in there? I mean, in a time when historians were paid to put this stuff out, Matthew seems to point this stuff out. Why would he do that? I think it has something to do with who Matthew was. You see, Matthew was a tax collector. And tax collectors back then were despised by Jewish people because they were Jewish people that had turned against their own people. They worked for Rome, and Rome said, you've got to tax everybody 40%, give us the money, but you can tax them 60% if you want and keep the extra for yourself, and they did, which made Matthew very wealthy but his only friends were tax collectors. Everybody hated Matthew. And one day Jesus is walking along with his disciples and he looks over and sees Matthew and says, Matthew, why don't you come and walk with us? You follow me. And the other followers are like, uh, does he know he's a tax collector? I mean, Jesus, I know we only got 11, but 11's good. And he's like, no, I feel like we need 12. So Matthew, come on. And he joins with them. And Matthew is so overwhelmed that Jesus would invite him to follow him that Matthew says, Jesus, I want to throw a party in your honor. Would you come to my house? He says, absolutely. So Matthew throws this crazy party there in his house. Who's the only people he knows? Tax collectors. And all tax collectors' friends come pouring into this place, and the bass is pumping, and the drinks are flowing, and Jesus is right there in the middle with a plate of hot wings, you know. And, and here comes all the church people, the Pharisees of the day, come rolling in, and they know how to kill a party. They show up and kind of kill a party like what happens when I show up at your party, right? And you're like, who invited the pastor? Oh, that's great. Come on in. 
And I, I try to help you out, really. I lay low. People ask me what I do. I say, oh, I work for a nonprofit, you know. And <laughs> if they press me, I'll say something clever like, oh, I sell fire insurance. You know, that's about it. So think about that. That's, that's funny. I don't care who you are. So <laughs> what, <clears throat> what Matthew is doing here is he's throwing this party, and the church people roll in, and they see what's going on, and they turn to Jesus' followers, and they say, what is your rabbi, your teacher, your leader doing in there with all of those tax collectors, prostitutes, adulterers, drunkards, and sinners. Watch how loud you speak around Jesus because he hears them. And notice what Jesus says, and I think this might have been the favorite thing Matthew ever wrote down. Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means, which that would have been so offensive to them. They thought they knew everything, and he's saying, you all need to go back and study some more. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Sacrifice is what you give to a God. Mercy is what you show to his people. And he said, you think you're right with God because of all of your sacrifices, but I tell you that your heavenly Father says you are only right when you are good to his kids. For I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. And this is a word that we all claim we don't believe in, but we all sure know what it means because we know when people sin against us. And we've all said the phrase before, well, I'm not perfect, because we all know that we've sinned. And there, are no one, there is no one that's righteous. We're all sinners. But here's the good news. Jesus says he's come for us. Here's what we often miss. We assume that Jesus came to keep all the sinners out. In fact, some of you right now, on your way into the building, you said, oh, I'll be surprised if the walls don't fall down when I walk into a church. And that's why maybe some of you are sitting outside right now, because you really believe that. But when we think that about Jesus, we have it all wrong because Jesus would say, I'm not about keeping sinners out. I have come to invite them in. And that's why Matthew tells us about the Christmas story by starting with the list. He's saying God is for people like us. This is exactly what the angels talked about when they broke the news to the shepherds that first Christmas night. Take a look at what they said. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news. I mean, what's good news? Straighten up. Quit what you're doing. Get it together. No, that's not good news. That's not even new news. Good news that will cause great joy for all the people. What is that news? Today in the town of David, a Savior. What's a Savior? One that can save us from our sin, that we're unable to wash out of our soul. He's been born to you or for you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Do you want to know how God is for you? It's because he came for you. Even when you are not for you, even when others are not for you, even when your circumstances are not for you, God is for you because the Christmas story tells us that he came for you. So let me address a couple groups of people. The first is this group of people that's basically saying, you know what, this religion stuff, it's not for me. It's not for me. That's for somebody else. That's, that's for other people. I'm not very religious. You know what Matthew would say to that? Neither am I. But Jesus didn't come to make us religious. He came to offer us a relationship with him and with his father. And for those of you that think that if I decide to be a God person, then I'm going to lose out on all the fun and make my life miserable, let me just ask you this. Do you think God sent his son as a baby to grow up and be crucified and then resurrect all so he could make your life worse? He has a plan for abundant life for you, bigger and better than you could ever ask or imagine in your own wildest dreams. And he knows what steers you away from the just the damage that we can do to ourselves because that's how for you he is. Now, some of you would say, you know what? There's no way God could be for me. 
mean, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm about. You don't know the past that keeps creeping up on me. You don't know my hurts and habits and hang-ups. And you know what? Everybody on that list would say, that's our story too. And if God can be for us, he can be for you. He came to save us from the very thing that we all wrestle with. How do I get right with God? How do I get rid of the stain on my soul? How do I deal with my guilt and my shame? How do I move beyond getting in my own way all the time? And Jesus says, that's why I've come. That's why I am for you. And friends, that's the gift that God gives to us. That's the gift given at Christmas, that God is for us, even when we're not always for him. About 25 years ago, uh, my wife and I got married, and we sat down to open up the wedding gifts. And one of us would unwrap, the other one would write down names and gifts so we could write out the thank you cards and everything. And then we'd switch places and, you know, do the same thing. And after it's all done, you got a, you know, stack of toasters and mixers and stuff to return and things you'll keep, things you don't even know what they are, you know. And, and I remember one of the last gifts we opened, I just unwrapped the package and I look at the box and it's a picture of a glass coffee pot. And it just simply says coffee decanter. And it's not like a Mr. Coffee that brews coffee for you. It's like a replacement coffee pot for the office, for that kind of a coffee machine. And I'm looking at this thing and thinking, what am I going to do with this? And we don't even drink coffee. Now, thanks to the grace of God, I now drink coffee and I've seen the light and it's wonderful. But <laughs> at the time, I didn't. And I'm looking at this thinking, what are we going to do with this? And I said, well, what, what pile should I put this in, Lori? And she said, well, we don't know where to return it. Let's just, let's just do what we do with the things we don't know what to do with. We just store them. Okay. So I put it underneath the bed or in a closet or whatever, you know, and then we moved. And I took it with us, the coffee decanter, under tow, took it in there, put it in the attic, set it there. We're there for a couple years. We moved again. Here came all the boxes and the coffee decanter. It gets moved as well. Several years, several moves, until finally one day I'm up in an attic, and I'm unpacking some stuff. By this point, I'm drinking coffee, and I look over, and I see this coffee decanter, and I think, hey, maybe it's time. So I go over there, and I pick up the box, and I open it up for the first time, and I look inside, and it's not a coffee decanter. It's this little decorative frame. And my two thoughts were, first of all, the thank you card. Thank you so much for the coffee decanter. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> but my second thought was, I've been carrying this gift around with me for years, and we never even knew it. I wonder... How many of us are doing that with the gift of Jesus? It's just waiting there. And you think, well, I believe he existed. Or, oh, my mother was religious. Or, oh, you know, in my family, we go to church once in a while. But you never have received it. It's a little bit like tomorrow morning, you're going to open a gift, and if you just take that gift and leave it there and walk off, is that really yours, or is it just something that was offered to you? I don't want you to go another year without the gift of forgiveness, without the gift of acceptance, without the gift of mercy and grace, without the gift of new life. What if today is the day you decide to accept that gift? So I want to just provide you an opportunity to open that gift, say yes to Jesus. And so right now, wherever you are, inside, outside, watching online, if you just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a second, I'm going to lead us through a prayer. And you might think, ah, I never prayed before. I don't know how to do this. I'm just going to say a prayer, and you can just repeat this to God just quietly there in your mind between you and God right after each phrase I say. You might want to personalize it more and say more, and that's perfectly fine. But this is our chance to say yes to this gift that God has provided. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for being for me. I know others aren't always for me. I'm not always for me. But thank you that you are. And I'm accepting the gift of Jesus. And I'm asking Jesus to be the leader and the forgiver of my life. Father, I thank you for all those who prayed that for the very first time. I thank you for the gift that you provide in Jesus. 
and for the celebration going on right now of all those who've decided to take you up on that offer. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen.